Okay. But the streaming software is kind of weird today. Um, anyway, um, let's start and hopefully nothing went wrong. Um, <clears throat> okay, so for today le today's lecture, uh, again, we will have two sections. Um, we'll first um, watch some more videos uh, from the Berkeley course. Um, then after that, we will have a practice session basically continue to work on what you have already started um, and since I actually have a uh, important project to uh, that's hitting a deadline today so um, we'll not be doing a Google Meet um, for the practice session uh, but you're also still supposed to do the practice uh, yourself um, and um, um, yeah, we'll talk about uh, uh, practice later after we finish the lectures. Um, so, just a quick recap for the past several lectures. We kind of intensely finished the, um, the first part of the Berkeley course. Uh, if you go to the edX site, it's the introduction to Agile. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, so that was supposed to be done in like four or five weeks uh, but we managed to squeeze it into like 2.5 uh, two and a half weeks uh, so starting from today we are moving forward um, and getting to the second part of this Berkeley course and you can find the uh, corresponding content um, in edX and the title for that part is advanced topics and technology in agile right so again in this course there are four modules uh, and roughly uh, we're from this point we're actually kind of going to slow down uh, the pace a bit uh, so that you can have enough time to understand uh, the materials the principles behind every single module uh, because uh, things starting from here are more important um, concepts um, versus uh, the intro part it's basically uh, we're going through the, the basics how to write Ruby how to use Rails uh, although we still have a bit more Ruby on Rails content to finish today um, but we're, once we're done with that, we'll get into stuff like BDD, TDD, DevOps, uh, refactoring, deal with Maxi code, and all that. <coughs> uh, all right, so, so for today's video, um, you will be able to find it uh, in Alex, uh, the advanced course, and that's module one. Okay. So, for the first part, we will uh, watch some more about Rails, um, and we will be, and then actually uh, the next lecture we will have another course uh, talking about Rails, and once we're done with that, we can uh, work it with Rails, and we will move on. Okay, so let's start the video. Now that you've gotten a basic SaaS app off the ground, so to speak, it's time to dive into some of the more sophisticated mechanisms to support more complicated apps. In this module, we're going to talk about a handful of such mechanisms, but probably the most prominent is associations. An association is a relationship between different kinds of resources in your app. For example, if we're going to enhance Rotten Potatoes to allow users to leave reviews of movies, and we might say that a given movie has many reviews, and a particular review belongs to exactly one movie. Uh, furthermore, for a particular moviegoer, we might identify which reviews have been written by that moviegoer. So a review also belongs to a moviegoer, and a moviegoer has many reviews. Like many SaaS frameworks, Rails uses a relational database to store each model's data. And fortunately for us, 
The relational algebra that defines the operations possible in relational databases gives us a way to express these kinds of associations using foreign keys. A foreign key is just an attribute of one record in a database table that refers to the primary key of a record in some other table. For example, a row in the reviews table, which refers to one review, might include the primary key of the row in the movies table that that review is about. So what's noteworthy about how this machinery works in Rails is that it's a great example of how a language and framework can work together to provide a useful abstraction that's easy to program against. As we'll see, Rails allows you to write Ruby code that behaves as if a single instance of a movie object holds a reference to an array of review objects that are associated with it. But in fact, the reference is not to an array at all. It's actually a reference to a different kind of object that looks, walks, and quacks like an ordered collection. So Rails takes advantage of three features of the Ruby language to define these so-called association methods. First, it uses metaprogramming to define methods at runtime that allow the associations to take place. Just by declaring that a movie should have many reviews, we can now dereference the reviews collection associated with a particular movie. Second, duct typing is used so that you can treat the collection of reviews as if it were an indexed array, even though that's not actually how it's stored or manipulated. And third, lazy evaluation is used so that the enumerable collection you think you have doesn't even exist until the very last possible moment that the database query can be deferred to. And at that moment, the appropriate SQL query is generated by active record to read from the database. As we'll see in the module on design patterns later on, this is actually an example of a design pattern called the proxy object. But the upshot of all of this is by adding just a few lines of code to your app, you automatically get machinery that lets you manipulate models in your relational database as if they were a graph of objects in memory. Of course, the ability of foreign keys to set up those relationships in the first place is one of the great features of relational algebra and relational databases. Remember that the next time that a colleague is singing the unvarnished praises of NoSQL databases. Now, you've probably heard the saying, if something is too good to be true or sounds too good to be true, it probably is too good to be true. And sure enough, the abstraction provided by Rails for associations isn't perfect. When we return to monitoring and optimizing performance of SaaS apps in the module on DevOps, we'll see that like all non-trivial abstractions, active record associations in Rails are leaky. In other words, it's an abstraction in which some details of the implementation cannot be completely ignored in certain cases when you use it, lest you suffer some unexpected consequences. But for the most part, associations are a great example of the heavy lifting associated with well-designed frameworks and how they can make it easy for you to write apps that adhere to its architectural pattern, which in our case is Model View Controller, by taking advantage of the features of the programming language in which the framework is written. All right, so that's the first video. Um, it basically talks about um, how to associate different models, uh, and later we explore more about the model association and how how Rails uh, manage that. Um, but before getting to the next video, I do have a quick comment regarding um, what the professor has mentioned about um, relational database and relational algebra. Um, <clears throat> so um, these days, uh, NoSQL is actually really, uh, uh, it's really a buzzword uh, that can get many developers hyped up. Um, but um, there is a good reason why uh, relational algebra or relational database is still being around. Um, and the reason is that it's very mature. Uh, and if you think about why we get so far uh, or why the um, relational database guy or the community gets so far uh, building and developing uh, this algebra and um, the products uh, or the database, the database like MySQL, PostSQL and all that. Uh, and uh, what's the one for Oracle? Yeah, something like that. Um, there's a good reason for that, right? Um, it's basically, 
just according to my experience, um, it's always um, um, using relational database almost always give me a better uh, development um, development experience. Uh, meaning I can be more efficient writing my application, I can write less code, especially with something um, <clears throat> like ORIAM, uh, for example, in, in Ruby on Rails, that's active record, um, but there's also other ORIAM available uh, for the other languages and frameworks. Uh, and then these ORIAMs and then the relational algebra actually offers a lot of feature that allows developer uh, to write all kinds of queries on the fly, or we call uh, ad hoc queries, uh, meaning you don't need to think about and plan uh, for how you are going to query this data uh, before you model it and before you use it. Uh, <clears throat> so all that you need to do uh, is actually model the data first. Um, breaking it down into tables, and then uh, map the relationships um, uh, using the foreign keys. And once it, you've done that, uh, pretty much you can always be able to uh, write queries that extract arbitrary data uh, as you need uh, without having to uh, modify uh, the database schema, uh, assuming that uh, the fields of each uh, table doesn't get changed. Um, versus for other NoSQL, also oh, we should clarify here, like NoSQL, there's actually uh, MySQL in terms of the, the functionality uh, and then the, the structure of, of the data it's kind of in the middle of the spectrum. Uh, and then when we talk about NoSQL, there are databases um, that's less structured, um, that's, um, um, that offers less uh, capability or feature in terms of uh, how you can write queries. So that's on the left side uh, where it's less SQL or less relational uh, versus when we talk about NoSQL on the other side, um, there are actually databases that's more really uh, more relational, uh, something like a uh, graphic database, right? So uh, if we go from here, the the, the lower end of the uh, left side, or the less structural side of the database spectrum, uh, there's something like uh, key value based database, uh, like memcache like redis um, and then there's a column oriented database um, like um, what do we have um, like Dynam dynamodb um, and cassandra that's on there and then there's traditional database and there's somewhere near that a document oriented database like mongodb and there's uh, something like graphic database, like Neo4j, right? So in terms of developing uh, developers' experience, uh, the more feature it offers, so the more information we know about the, the structure of the data being stored in the database, uh, the database can basically offer more feature or more flexible, uh, flexible query interface or query language for developer to use. Uh, so it always, um, the experience of the developer always goes better when we get to this end of the spectrum, whereas compared to other database, uh, something like uh, key value database, column oriented database, um, it requires more work for developer um, to prepare, to design, to plan how we're going to model the data. Um, how uh, we're going to figure out the relationship if there's no such thing as a foreign key, um, you know, stuff like that. Uh, but we, what we get from uh, this side is uh, we have, we gain more flexibility in terms of uh, modeling the data.
Um, so if we want to go really hardcore uh, towards performance or storage space, uh, then that's the way to go because it offers more flexibility. Um, you can actually design the data structure uh, yourself. <clears throat> Although that being said, uh, since you have to design the data structure yourself, it al it's also more work for you uh, to develop the programs based on these uh, databases. So there's uh, different, some pros and cons in terms of choosing what kind of database you would use. And um, just like the professor mentioned, um, when something is super hyped about NoSQL, um, give it a question mark. Um, sometimes there's a good reason to use NoSQL. For example, it needs um, super, some super performance, um, really low latency, um, or super scalable data storage. But otherwise, uh, MySQL, or not MySQL, uh, relational database might be the default good option um, for you. Um, okay, so that's uh, a bit more comments on the first video. Uh, let's move on to the next one. <laughs>Uh, let's talk about today's main technical topping, uh, an, a technical topic, not topping, uh, an idea that bears repeating, ha, huh? come on, I'm trying, uh, validations and filters. So a lot, of, uh, a lot of the emphasis in software engineering is trying to reduce repetition, make uh, good use of reusing existing code, and one challenge is when the thing that you're trying to reuse is not sort of a piece of code located in, in sort of one place, uh, but it's sort of a cross-cutting concern. It's uh, something that you have to pay attention to at various points in the app. So uh, a cross-cutting concern is something that uh, is a consideration that arises in, ter in terms of execution and code flow could arise at a bunch of different points in the app, but you would still like to avoid duplicating any code or logic that has to do with it. So a simple example of something like that is uh, back to our simple Rotten Potatoes app. Suppose we want to enforce that movie titles have to be less than 40 characters. So the naive way to do this is every place in the app where a movie's title might get edited, so you know the form for creating one, the form for updating one, the form for retrieving one from TMDB, you could define some check function and then make sure that every place in the app where a movie might be edited, you arrange to call that function. Um, that's obviously pretty brittle because now you have a bunch of repeated calls to the function all over the place. Uh, you have to make sure that every one of them gets updated. So what is a way to handle concerns like this, still keep the information in one place, but avoid that level of repetition? And to do that, we will uh, bring in a couple of ideas from aspect-oriented programming, which my guess is for most people is probably uh, a phrase you haven't necessarily worked with before. Uh, the idea of aspect-oriented programming is exactly that you can capture these cross-cutting concerns in a way that is almost independent of where in the app you're going to use the concerns. So advice is a specific piece of code that implements a cross-cutting concern. So the code that checks, let's say, whether the movie's title is 40 characters or less. Point cuts are places in the app where at runtime you would like that code to take effect. And if you put together the advice plus a point cut, that's called an aspect, hence aspect-oriented programming. And this is a mechanism for drying out your code so that you can put this knowledge in one place but rely on it essentially being accessed from a bunch of places. So how does this work in Rails? Rails is not fully an aspect-oriented language. A true aspect-oriented language would basically give you a lot of freedom in what kind of advice you can define and how you specify the point cuts. But in Rails, because it's a model view controller framework, there are a couple of specific places where it makes sense to allow these point cuts to happen. So the first example that we'll look at are called validations. And a validation uh, from the advice point of view is a set of invariants that you would like to be true about any instance of a model that is going to get saved. So in our simple case here, where uh, what we would like to be true is the title is less than 40 characters. Um, and then the question is, where do you define that advice, and how do you specify, or where are the point cuts, the places where, even if you don't explicitly try to call the function, the advice is going to get applied. So here's how that looks. Um, if we reopen our movie class, 
uh, and we add these two lines. The first line says, uh, I would like to validate that the title attribute of movie has the following properties. First of all, that it is present, so it can't be blank, can't be the empty string, and that we check its length and it has to be a maximum of 40. Uh, as you might expect, there's a lot of other options uh, that could go with this. You can specify a minimum and maximum, and you can check it against a regular expression. But again, as usual, my goal is give you a sense of how this works, and then you can go look at the exhaustive version. I would also, in the second line, say I'm going to validate that in terms of the release date attribute of a movie, uh, it just has to be present. I'm, I'm not asserting anything about, you know, it has to be within a certain date or something like that, uh, but it has to not be blank. So, when do these, and I could also say, uh, if I want to do something a little more uh, customized, uh, suppose I only want to have movies in my database that were released 1930 or later, because that's when the MPAA movie code uh, actually went into effect. So movies made before then actually don't have ratings in the sense that we think of them. Um, I can define my own custom function that basically checks that if the movie has a release date, or if it's been specified, and the release date is less than some threshold, then I will add an error saying that the release date must be 1930 or later. Again, don't worry about the syntax. Think about what's going on here. I'm defining a custom validation that isn't sort of a simple thing I can express uh, with one of the built-in validation checkers. Um, and then uh, I, on the third line, it just says, um, in addition to the specific attributes, title and release date, also run this function. And this function can do whatever it wants. It can look at any attributes of the object. It can enforce any conditions. It can enforce things that uh, you know, are time varying. It can uh, look at relationships between different fields. So basically, any invariant that you want to assert. And just to do one last example, I can also say, uh, well, if the release date is uh, greater than, I'm, I'm going to pick a, you know, a random other date here, um, I'm going to say that a movie uh, has to have a rating. So here's validates rating. The rating is included in this array that I've defined up here, which contains the standard movie ratings. But uh, I only want to do that if the movie is not grandfathered in. So what's grandfathered? It's another function that I can define. All right, so in this case, I'm saying a movie is grandfathered if its release date is greater than some class variable, the grandfathered date. Uh, so all of which is to say that I can do you know, the first two examples, title and release date. Those are sort of built-in examples of things you can check. I can write a simple function that can look at any aspect at all of the uh, model and enforce any validation check on it. Um, and I can condition any kind of validation on some predicate, so that if this predicate is true, then the validation isn't run. That's the basic idea of how validations work. And in a moment, we'll talk about when these things actually get applied. So this is the code that verifies whether certain conditions are always true of a model instance. And now the question is, how do we determine when does that code get run, and why does it get run? Before I do that, I wanted to address a question. Yeah, it's, it's just syntax. But I think the question is why, is, why are some of them validate and why are some of them validates? Uh, the general answer is validates is followed by an attribute and then some conditions on that attribute. But validate, without the S, is I'm going to provide my own custom function. Please call it. It's just syntax. Th there's no good reason, sadly. OK, so the, quest the next question is when do these pieces of code actually get called? When do they do their stuff? And by the way, what is the stuff that they do? Um, you can get a clue from my custom validator function. Because if the condition that it's looking for, uh, meaning that the release date is less than this, uh, if that condition is true, then it adds, it, it's calling errors.add. What is errors? Errors is actually an, uh, an object that's included with every instance of an active record model. And it's where all of these validation functions are going to stash their error messages if they find that the condition's violated. So for example, when we run this code and it finds, for, whatever, for example, that the title is not present or that the title is more than 40 characters, uh, the, the built-in validator will say errors.add and it, you'll get, end up with something like title is too long, 40 characters as maximum or something to that effect. I don't remember the exact canned message it gets. But errors is basically its own object. Right? So the general pattern here is we've set up some code that is going to look at some conditions on the model to make sure that the model is sort of valid, right? that these conditions are true. And if any of the conditions are violated, it's going to add one or more messages to this other object called errors, which is part of the model. And 
if the validations fail, we can look in the errors object to see exactly which ones failed and what went wrong. So when does this get called? The key idea of this slide is it gets called every time you save. That's, if you remember nothing else from this slide, remember that one thing. When do those validations get called? Right before something is about to be committed to the database. That could be because it's being created for the first time. That's the path on the left. It could be because an existing model instance is being updated in place. That's the path on the right. And in fact, uh, there's various ways that you can control when the validations are run if you want to be more specific. Uh, so there's various points called lifecycle hooks where you can say, uh, before you validate, do something to the model. So for example, you might want to canonicalize the date uh, if the user entered the date in a weird format. Or if you're checking email addresses for validity, you might want to like, make the email address all lowercase before you actually do the validation. But the most important thing here is, before it gets saved in the database, validations will be run. And if you remember way back to when we introduced Active Record, and uh, there was the idea of calling save, or you could call save bang. Uh, when you created a new object, you could call create, or you could call create bang. Now you kind of have some context for what's going on there. When you call save and it returns nil, or if you call save bang and it raises an error, usually it's because one or more of the validations didn't pass. So essentially, uh, unless you specifically override, which I don't recommend that you do, Rails will basically not let you save an invalid object into the database, whether it's a newly created one or whether it's the update of an existing object. Right? Because the validations will run, and if they don't work, the save actually does not happen. Right? And if you're going to ask, yes, there is actually a way to force it to say, bypass all the validations, do what I say, and save the object. That is rarely a good idea, because when you're expressing validations, what you're basically doing is you're expressing invariance. Right? An invariant is some condition that your code can safely rely on always being true. So for example, if you know that you have specified for a movie that the release date cannot be blank, then it is always safe for your code to, for example, compare the release date to something. If you didn't have the invariant of the release date cannot be blank, there's always some possibility that if you grab a movie that has a blank release date and you try to compare the release date with a date object, you'll get an error because you'll be comparing something with nothing. So validations are one way of saying, this is an invariant that I want to be true of any model that I choose to persist in the database. And it's at your own risk to sort of circumvent that mechanism. Right? And it's also a way to put the, the knowledge in exactly one place about what those conditions are. You typically will find it at the very top of the active record model file. It doesn't have to go there. It can actually go anywhere in the model. But in terms of readability, think of it as almost a declaration of, here are the things that are always true about a movie. It has a non-blank title, which is never more than 40 characters. It's always got a release date. And it's never been released before 1930. Right? And then everywhere else in your code, when you manipulate a movie, you can take advantage of those assumptions to prune out some error checking. Okay? So validation automatically happens here, right before a save of any kind. You can also explicitly do it. You can call valid question mark on any instance of an active record object, and you'll get back a truthy value or a falsy value, depending on whether the validations all passed or if anything failed. And if they did fail, um, then first of all, you know that save will also fail. Um, and you can also look in errors, uh, which is an object that has cool behaviors of its own, and stores all of the messages of why the validation didn't pass. A typical thing that you would do in this case is you would take whatever is in errors, you would put it into the flash, and then you would redirect back to wherever the user just was saying, you couldn't save, you know, this, this movie couldn't be saved or updated because, and then the errors will just list, here's all the things that went wrong. So that's one kind of point cut and aspect that Rails provides. Right? Now you don't get to control exactly when it runs. Rails prescribes that it runs whenever you have a flow that is about to update the database. So it's not true aspect-oriented programming because you have no freedom to say when validations uh, are automatically run. Rails decides that for you. You do have the freedom to say what the validations are. So the advice aspect is totally up to you. And as I showed in my simple, simple example, there's a handful of sort of standard validations for checking things like, is it a number? Is it greater than or equal to something? Uh, is it a null string? Does it have some number of characters? The common cases like that there are built-in ones, and then you can also define your own function for my crazy validation of whatever I want. Uh, so in a model view controller app, 
The other place where sort of action happens is the controller. So there is a similar uh, kind of AOP mechanism, aspect-oriented programming, that applies to controllers. And they are called controller filters, even though that terminology is sort of left over from Rails 2 or Rails 3. Uh, but people still refer to them as filters. And the idea here is uh, another cut point, or point cut, another place where you can have something happen without explicitly calling it from the code is right before some controller action is about to be done. So picture the moment in time, right? The user has uh, submitted an HTTP request with some sort of a route. The routing system has figured out that the route maps to a particular action inside a particular controller. Immediately before the controller action is run, uh, Rails will see whether there are any controller filters that might apply to that action. So let's take a look at uh, what those controller filters can do. And the big difference uh, between validations and controller filters is a controller filter can stop the show. Because it's the controller that gets control, haha, uh, as soon as something happens in the app, um, the controller filter can immediately do, it can sort of take over the powers of the controller action. It can immediately do a redirect or it can choose to render a view and basically say, no, we're done. The original controller action is not going to be allowed to run for whatever reason. Um, and instead, I'm sort of bypassing it and saying, this is how the request is going to finish out. Um, and usually when, when it does this, this is the case when before it does a redirect or render, you've put something in the flash so that when that next page is displayed, the user will have some clue of why the controller action didn't fire. So what would this look like? Um, here's a simple example of one. Um, this one is trying to capture the idea that most controller actions in, in this hypothetical app are only legal if the user is already logged in. So does that mean that in every single controller action, you have to put a statement of the form if user is logged in? No, you declare it in one place. So I've, I've uh, hypothesized a function called set current user, um, which basically assumes that at some point in the past, somebody has logged in and we've stored their user ID somewhere in the session. So at this point, um, I'm basically setting at current user to, uh, if it's not already set, to find whoever the, uh, if there was a user ID stored in the session, then that's, you know, that means that that person somehow in the past has logged in. Uh, if that's not the case, then I'm going to redirect to some other action called login, and this is where the code would go to serve the login page. Okay, so this is going to get run because I'm saying up here, before action, set current user. What that means is, within this controller, before any action in the controller is allowed to run, on every single request, run this uh, set current user function. And if the set current user function ends up not being able to set current user, in other words, if current user still ends up as nil, then it will stop the show by saying, nope, uh, we're done here. We're going to redirect to the login page. And then the user can log in, and, and we try again, or whatever. OK, so my question is, what is the problem with this code the way that I have expressed it? And if you want a hint, there were in one of the previous homeworks, there were a flurry of Piazza posts about uh, I'm getting an infinite redirect loop when I try to run my code. So before every controller action, I'm going to try to run this set current user. And if it's not finding someone in the session, it will immediately try to do a redirect and run the login action, which is supposed to give the user a chance to log in. What's the problem with this the way I've written it? Or more precisely, why will this formulation, the way I've written it, result in infinite redirects? Yeah? Uh, this one can also apply to the login. Yeah. <laughs> the login is one of the controller actions. So unfortunately, the filter for making sure you're logged in will also be run before the action that logs you in. So you'll never actually get to this point. right? Because as soon as it tries to redirect, well, the redirect triggers an entire new HTTP request, which means the before action is going to be run again, and you're still not logged in, so you'll just infinitely go into this loop where you redirect to the login action. And the solution, as usual, is pretty simple. Right? When you specify a controller filter, you can say uh, it should not apply to certain actions. Or if you prefer, you could say it only applies to the, to the following controller actions. OK, let me pause. Um, what questions so far about this? Okay, we, we've sort of defined two different ways that you can specify a cross-cutting concern and have that code invoked uh, 
even without you explicitly calling it. Right? And the two ways that we've specified are validations, which apply to the model, and filters, which apply to the controller. They have many things in common. Both of them are examples of aspect orientation because they allow you to provide advice, some conditions that you are checking that you wish to make sure are true. They both rely on specific point cuts. And in Rails, the point cuts are defined for you. Validations are run uh, during these lifecycle hooks, most importantly, anytime there's a save. Controller filters are run before and or after. You can also specify filters that run after a controller action. So for example, you can log, somebody just did something. Somebody just updated the super user record in the database. Uh, I allowed it to happen, but you can run an after action. Um, validations cannot, on their own, change the flow of execution. Now, you can, in your controller, you can, uh, before trying to do a save, you can run the validations. And if the validations fail, you can report that fact to the user and have them try again. But you have to make sure that happens. The act of a validation failing does not, in and of itself, cause a visible control flow change from the user's point of view. Whereas the controller filters can do that. The controller filter can say, we're going to cut off the action right now, either with a redirect or by rendering a different template than the one associated with the controller action that was protected. In both cases, you can provide an arbitrary function. In fact, for controller filters, that's the only way to do it. There are no shortcut controller filters. Whatever the filter is, you have to provide a little piece of code that says, here's the conditions I'm checking. And if the conditions fail, you have to decide in that piece of code what to do. Render, redirect, blow up the universe, whatever. And if something goes wrong, uh, the errors are stored for validations along with the errors object, which is part of the model. You get that for free. And in the case of a controller filter, because you're writing your own code, you have to decide how to make visible to the user what happened. And the most common way to do that is, for example, you put it in the flash, and you just arrange for every page in your app to check if there's something in the flash, make sure you always display it. It's a fairly common Railsism, because since the flash tends to be used for messages like that that are ephemeral, um, it's typical for like every page in the app to have a place where if the flash has something in it, just show whatever it is. Okay, so that's kind of the summary. Again, my goal is to give you the high level version of how this works and to frame it in terms of aspect orientation, which is actually uh, kind of an important idea in programming systems. So Rails is not sort of you know, fully aspect oriented, but you get specific aspects that you can use, in this case, validations and filters. And there's a question. Why do validations on their own not change the execution flow? Um, essentially, when you, uh, so what, at what point does a validation try to happen? It's happening right before you do a database save. At that point, suppose we assert the opposite and say, well, validations should be allowed to change the control flow. The question is, what could it do? Right? What would be a reasonable thing for it to do? Because for a controller filter, you know exactly the moment in time when a controller filter runs. It is right before the moment when your own code in the controller is about to be handed uh, control of the HTTP requests. So the controller filter runs at a very predictable point in the workflow of model view controller. However, validations could be triggered anywhere. They could be triggered deep in your model methods. They could be triggered from your controller. So there isn't sort of any single strategy that would make sense for how to change the execution path um, if you don't really know what the context is when the validation is done. For example, if you have a complicated uh, interaction where you're trying to save three or four different models at once, and only one of those models fails validation, what's the right thing to do? Well, you can decide in your code what the right thing to do is, but there's sort of no automatic answer to what you should do. But with a controller filter, the sort of time and conditions under which it runs are very, very narrowly defined. So a reasonable thing to do is say, well, if the controller action is not going to be allowed to proceed, what other option do we have? Well, it's HTTP. We have to do something. We have to either redirect or we have to render. So we can just put the redirect or render call right in the filter. Right? But it's because it's running at a very, very highly constrained moment in time. That's why there's an automatic way to do it. Good question. By the way, is there any downside to doing all this stuff? There is always a downside. Right? Anytime you add a mechanism that is intended to save you some work as the programmer, um, there's always the cost that if you overuse the mechanism or if you use it poorly, uh, you might actually end up making your code less readable. And in this case, uh, a standard critique of AOP generally is that if you overuse this, it can make the code hard to debug. So for example, you're debugging your app. You think that there's a problem with some controller method. You put a buy bug statement so that when the app hits that controller method, 
you can like drop into the debugger and look around, and then you try running the app and it never hits the debugger. And after hours of debugging, you figure out that there's like some long chain of before filters, and one of the before filters decided that something wasn't good, and it stopped the show. And unfortunately, whoever wrote that before filter didn't put anything in the log file, didn't put anything in the flash. So you sort of had no clue of like where in the chain of events did something not work the way I thought? Why didn't my controller method get called? Oh, I see. It's this before filter, and there's also this one and this one. So as with all such mechanisms, you use them judiciously. Right? If you find that your controller has like five or six before filters, something is wrong. Right? You should be asking yourself, did you define your controller in such a way that there are, it's being asked to check too many conditions, things that are not necessarily its responsibility? So use responsibly, right? Like, just like cigarettes and alcohol, or at least alcohol. OK. So, <laughs> that was on tape, wasn't it? OK. That's fine. So the sort of conceptual summary here is AOP is a way of drying out what are called cross-cutting concerns. The pro is exactly that. You define a concern in one place, and there are now many places from which it will basically automatically be invoked for you. The downside is there are many places from which it will automatically be invoked for you, and if you overuse the mechanism, it can become e easy to sort of lose track of what the, the straight line control flow of the code is. Um, Rails does not have full aspects. Uh, there are some languages that do, but it provides these two specific flavors of it because they make sense in model view controller. For a model, you want to check whether certain things about a model instance are always true. For controllers, you if you want to check whether some conditions are true before letting the user action go forward, um, and if not, you can sort of shortcut the situation. Um, we are not going to talk about in lecture, but they're super simple to understand, so please watch the video or, or look in the book. Partials, which are basically little pieces of a view that you can use to build up views. So if you've got some common content that gets reused in many different views, um, you can essentially pull it out into the moral equivalent of a view subroutine and include it in many different places. All right, so that's our second video today. Um, a few more comments on that. Um, just like the, the professor had mentioned, uh, everything, there's pros and there's cons. Um, so by using AOP, um, we're essentially making the hard, uh, the code harder to read if it is not done correctly. Uh, or, uh, like, like we've mentioned, uh, when we talk about convention over configuration, uh, for example, for some beginner, it might be hard to, for them to understand uh, when they uh, try to debug an application that implements AOP. Because uh, the idea behind AOP is we extract the concerns, um, or um, what we say here, um, what's the term we use? Uh, the advice, yeah. Advice, so we extract the advice or the concern uh, out of the uh, normal flow of the code. Um, and then sometimes uh, concerns are shared across um, different, uh, in real situation, um, uh, shared between different uh, controllers or sometimes shared between different uh, models then it will be extracted uh, to a separate file. Uh, then imagine for a new member on the team to debug something, and he or she might expect that the thing that goes wrong is in a certain model or a certain controller. Um, and then he or she would look through that code uh, of that model or controller, and if what's wrong is happening in the vice or the concern, um, then she, she or she, he or she would have no clue about what went wrong because um, the code for the model or controller itself is perfectly correct. Um, and then without knowing there's uh, AOP happening and there could possibly be a separate file uh, for the source code that actually cutting to uh, the normal flow of the code execution, then it would be very hard to, to debug and find what what's the actual code that's mi misbehaving. Um, so when using AOP, there's 
again pros and cons. But again, uh, Rails is a, an opinionated framework, and when we talk about validation, filters, this kind of stuff, uh, Ruby, or, Ruby on Rails are the main choice. Uh, so kind of have to live with that. Uh, but there are other frameworks out there that don't uh, implement ALP. Um, although um, I personally still prefer uh, frameworks that has ALP uh, and makes things uh, a lot more convenient when we uh, need that uh, for something like validation. Because uh, otherwise you will need to you know implement the validation in a controller. And then if there are multiple controllers, um, doing the same thing or doing something similar um, with a specific model, um, then you kind of have to repeat the validation a couple of times, even though you can you know, extract that validation into a, let's say, a separate function or method, but still you have to write that uh, method um, every time before you save, you, you write the, the code to save the model or the save the record. Uh, and then most likely uh, some point at some point down the line you will forget one of those and then what would happen is you will get that back um, where in most controllers one model will always would always be validated versus there might be a single action controller action that got left out because you forgot it and then um, the validation didn't happen then there will be some uh, wrong or invalid data record end up in your database. Um, the other thing I want to mention is uh, the ALP way to do the validation versus uh, uh, some other way to do validation. For example, a most straightforward way to do validation is just go through checks. You know, right? If certain condition, if it doesn't match, then throw an error. Uh, if, if if it's okay, then it pass. Then go to the next rule. Uh, if if it fails, throw an error or an exception. Um, but when we deal with uh, validation, it almost always makes sense to use AOP uh, versus the straightforward way to do validation, uh, meaning to go through conditional checks and throw errors. Uh, primarily because. Um, it's easier to, um, I mean, the the, con the flow control is already managed by OP, so you don't need to worry about that. Uh, but also, uh, in terms of user experience, uh, what I have seen in some uh, websites, especially uh, government websites, uh, funny enough, uh, also in some frameworks, and I won't name it, and actually I don't remember w which one exactly, um, where, uh, for example, when asking, when showing a folder, uh, showing a form for user to sign up, um, usually will ask for like email and password, right? Um, and let's say I type one two three four five six for the password. Uh, of course, it will show an error, uh, saying, "Hey, this password is too short. It should ask at least be like eight characters long." Okay, so I then type one two three four five six seven and eight and submit again and see another error saying hey uh, the password has to have uh, let's say uh, not only digit but also uh, some english characters but then i maybe type a b c d e f and one two three four five and sub again and then see another error saying hey actually you also need a uh, special character uh, character uh, and after all that maybe i submit it again with a, a perfect fine password, then it shows me that, hey, your, e your email is actually invalid. Um, so just imagine if you do the if else check and then throw error that way, um, in terms of user experience, you are always just showing one error versus uh, the AOP way, it's adding errors uh, into a, an array or list where you can show all the errors at once. Um, so when we talk about user experience, uh, I'm seeing all the errors that's in my like invalid password. Like it shouldn't be too short. It also has to mix character uh, digits 
and special characters, uh, stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, uh, if we talk about specifically about uh, validation, uh, AOP is always a better pattern uh, to apply for that because uh, you're basically um, doing all the errors. Um, and I mean, add, adding all the errors uh, into an array, and then you can show all the errors at once to the user. Uh, versus you have to, you know, go through the errors one by one. It's it's going to be a very frustrating experience for user uh, to correct for all the errors. Uh, right. So let's move on to our third and last video for today. Okay, let's talk about really fun stuff. This came up, uh, actually, uh, some students asked me about this earlier, and I said, we'll, we'll be covering this really soon. Single sign-on and third-party authentication. So this is an, it's easy to motivate this problem. Um, a few years ago, the New York Times had this neat functionality that all of a sudden turned on one day, and you could see what articles your Facebook friends were reading and liking in the New York Times. So suppose you wanted something like that for Rotten Potatoes. In the New York Times example, it meant that somehow the New York Times website is able to access your Facebook information, like who your friends are and what they were reading. But clearly, you don't want to be doing this by revealing your Facebook password to the New York Times site. So as a general rule, even though you want sites to possibly be able to share information about you with each other for your benefit, you don't want to do this by revealing your login information to different sites. Right? And the canonical example here is you would never reveal your login information about your bank account even though you might find it useful for some other applications to have limited access to some of that information. So the way that we handle this case, which is increasingly the way that authentication is done today, is we use third-party authentication. So let's make sure we understand some building blocks of how this works. Uh, the first building block is what's called a tamper-evident secure token. Tamper-evidence just means that there is a string that I can create that if you try to tamper with it by perturbing a few characters, it will essentially become an invalid string. It will become unusable. Um, and the way I do this is I can create a string that, uh, because there's a secret that only I know, it's a string that only I can decrypt. I'm the only one that can make use of it. Um, I can also detect if it's been tampered with, because if you tamper with it and I try to decode the tampered version, it won't decode properly. So I can basically create it in such a way that unless it decodes to have some specific fields and formats, I can tell that it's been tampered with. And because I created it by using a secret that only I know, presumably nobody else could have created a string like that unless they somehow got a hold of my secret key. And in most cases, the string really is just a handle to other information that I'm storing. So the string doesn't necessarily contain the interesting information. It contains enough information that I can store the state locally and retrieve it later. A simple thing you can imagine it containing is I'm storing that information in my database, and the string encodes like the primary key, let's say, of a particular database row corresponding to the information about a particular user. So how do we use this capability? We're going to use an example of uh, connecting Rotten Potatoes to Twitter. And after we explain this, I'm actually going to do a code walkthrough to show you how it works. I, I actually have connected Rotten Potatoes to Twitter. It was easy. Um, so here I am. Uh, here is my pet toucan, who sadly is no more. But uh, during the time that I wrote the book, she actually supervised a lot of the writing, as you can see. And uh, I, want to be, I want to be able to use my Twitter account information to log into Rotten Potatoes. So how do I do that without revealing my Twitter password? The first thing is I let Rotten Potatoes know that I want to log in with Twitter which causes Rotten Potatoes to essentially send me back a redirect, which sends me over to Twitter. So this is an important concept, because I'm about to type in my Twitter credentials, but I'm not typing them into Rotten Potatoes. I'm typing them only into Twitter. Presumably, I can trust Twitter with my Twitter password. And Twitter can then present a page to me saying, Rotten Potatoes is asking if it can access your information. Is that OK? And it's not revealing what my password is. It's just saying, this particular user signed into this other application, Rotten Potatoes, wants to use your Twitter information. Are you good with that? Assuming that I am good with it, and I'm saying, yes, that's fine. Give, give all my personal information. Let it tweet as me. Do whatever you want. Twitter will then redirect to a callback page, and it will provide an access token that was created according to the guidelines that we just talked about. So what, what are those guidelines? It's created based on a secret that only Twitter knows. The token encodes information about what I said was OK to do. So the information is formatted in such a way that if Twitter is ever handed back that token, it can decrypt it and verify whether the thing that Rotten Potatoes is trying to do on my behalf is one of the things that I agreed to. 
right? That's what, so that's why a tamper evident container is so important. And at that point, whenever Rotten Potatoes wants to do something on my behalf on Twitter, it basically presents the token and says, look, here's the proof, right? You made this token, no one else could have made it. Here's the token that presumably proves that this user said it's okay to act on their behalf on the Twitter site, right? That's the basic flow for third party auth. Um, and once Twitter has done that, it can, for example, get my username or my screen name from Twitter and start to personalize my screens using that information. So this is kind of a simple uh, example of third party authentication, but this flow is basically how it works for all sites. One of the more popular protocols now used for this is called OAuth. Uh, it's kind of in its second major version. The bad news is OAuth is pretty hairy. The good news is that there's a gem that makes it really easy to use, as uh, I'm about to show you. So how do we actually put this into our application architecture? The idea is pretty neat. You actually model a session as its own entity. So if you think of a session beginning at the time that I log in and ending either with me logging out or with it timing out, like my abandoning, then we can think of a session controller whose job it is to create and delete the session. And that's where we can centralize the logic that's going to negotiate with the remote service and try to uh, act on my behalf. Now, once the user has been authenticated, we still need some local representation of who that user is. So the most common scheme is that you use the session to remember the primary key of the authenticated user. And remember that Rails also uses tamper evidence techniques to create the session. So it's not as if you can grab the session and stick a user ID in there and be logged in as that user, right? You'd have to be able to tamper with a tamper evidence string in order to fool the session into carrying around your information. Um, we're going to show an example in a moment using the OmniAuth gem, which provides a uniform API from your app's point of view and has strategies for talking to many different backend authentication providers. An auth provider is basically any service that has information about you and wants to allow an external service to act as you. Twitter is an example. Facebook is an example. Google is an example with Google Apps or Google Plus. Um, other examples abound. GitHub is an example for that matter. Let's do a code walkthrough. Code walkthroughs, I, I think, are useful because there's a, a gap between how something works conceptually and how it works in real life. So this is when we go without a net, and I hope that the demo that I put together actually works just as well <laughs> when I do it in lecture as it did when I was doing it at home. Actually, not when I was doing it at home, when I was doing it at my office. I didn't do it at home because frickin' Comcast is not working again. <laughs> and I don't care if the rest of the world hears that. OK. OK. Uh, so what did I do? OK. So let's start by doing a code walkthrough. Let's, first of all, what, what's the experience that we're going after here? My goal is to get it so that I can log in to Rotten Potatoes using my Twitter information, using my Twitter account, and thereby have Rotten Potatoes have access to at least some of my Twitter information, even something basic like my screen name. So here's the user experience, which I really hope works. Uh, oh, and let me make sure that I, let's get rid of the debugger thing. That was for illustrative purposes only. So uh, you can see that I've added a new link up here in the corner. It says log in with your Twitter account. When I click on it, I get taken over to, uh, I'm actually on Twitter's site. I'm securely connected to Twitter's site. I now get to log in as me, if I can remember what my Twitter password is, because I never use it. And uh, let's do the happy path first. I'm going to authorize the app. I'm back. And hello. Uh, Hold on a second. OK, sorry about that. I guess I had to reload the page. Um, so now it knows who I am. And you could probably, uh, I guess it's not hard for you to believe that the only place I could have gotten this information is from Twitter, because I haven't actually logged into Rotten Potatoes directly. Right? There's no login flow that's part of my app. The, all, the only login flow I did was on Twitter. So this is actually coming from Twitter directly. Uh, and if I log out, it reverts to log in with your Twitter account, and hopefully Redirecting, there, OK. I don't know why the redirect didn't work the first time. So that's the kind of the most basic example. So let's kind of take a look at the moving parts of the code and see how everything worked. Um, the first thing is, if we go back to kind of the initial phase, um, what happens, where is the application going when I click this link? Well, uh, I don't know if you can kind of see down here in the address bar, but when I hover over it, uh, it's going to slash off slash Twitter. So what is that? Is that like a route in my application? Um, actually, that is a route provided by the OmniAuth gem. Um, here's my routes file. So, when I, so OmniAuth is a really nice library that abstracts away essentially the entire process. Right? It provides the necessary routes, the callbacks. 
and all of the OAuth logic to work with different providers. The only things that I have to provide in terms of my application is, first of all, uh, I have to tell OmniAuth which strategy I want to use. So what is the third party site that I want to try to connect to? In our case, it's Twitter. Um, and there's another config file whose name I forget. There it is, auth.yaml. There we go. Uh, I won't, <laughs> I guess I'll be changing my consumer key and consumer secret now that they're on the screen and therefore on the internet. Um, but uh, when you create an application and you want to have your application potentially be able to interoperate with a third party auth provider like Twitter, you actually also have to be a Twitter user and set up an API key as a Twitter developer. That API key is what's going to allow your developer app to connect with Twitter. So different uh, sites have different ways of how they generate the key. But basically, we're telling OAuth, here's the information you're going to need to even attempt to establish a dialogue with Twitter about doing this. Okay. So what else do we have to put in our routes file? Well, whenever we go to slash auth slash some provider, the OmniAuth gem will actually take care of redirecting that to the remote site. The interaction with the remote site, uh, once it's handled, the way the remote site works is once you've authenticated successfully, it will try to do a callback to a URL inside your application. Right? So this is kind of a generic version of this flow is once I've finished authenticating myself on Twitter.com, it's actually going to try to do a redirect back to another page on my site. And that redirect is going to include as its data that secret token that I'm going to use whenever I want to actually request access to my Twitter features. So that means that we have to provide an endpoint for that callback to come back. Right? And that is what this route is specifying. Basically, using provider as a wildcard, because Twitter is a provider, we could use Google. There's like 20 different provider strategies that this gem supports. But basically, we'll need to provide uh, a route that looks like this and that does whatever our app is going to do on successful authentication. So remember I mentioned that the abstraction here is we're going to model the session as its own thing. We're going to have a controller that creates a new session when you successfully log in and destroys that session when you either log out or the session times out. So we're going to go to the session's controller in a minute, and we're going to show what this function does. What happens if authentication fails? Well, we're supposed to provide a route that will map slash off slash failure. And we have to provide a controller method that does something in the event that the user failed to authenticate properly to Twitter. Or in the event that the user decided to decline and you know, they, they clicked the Cancel button on Twitter and said, actually, no, you don't have access to do this. The reason that these are called slash auth slash whatever is because OmniAuth is remapping the callback that comes from Twitter. So if you look at Twitter's API developer documentation, they will have a URL that they expect you to pass. And so this is the URL that we're going to call back. When OmniAuth is handling this for you, it passes a URL that looks like this. So basically, the, what OmniAuth is saying is, when authentication is complete, this is the URL that you should use for a callback. And I will expect you, Twitter, to pass back any parameters that contain that secret token that's going to be the basis of future access. Um, in fact, I, I will, uh, since we're here anyway, I'm going to trigger the sad path. And what you'll see is that I did not write a handler for the sad path. OK, I did not sign in. That's, my, uh, that's Twitter letting me know that you've declined to do this. And if I try to return, um, again, if you can see the bottom of the screen, you can kind of, it's kind of hard to read, isn't it? Because it's in like fly spec 3. Um, if you could read it by getting really close up to the screen, so internet people come close to the screen. Um, but what you can see in the bottom bar is that if I click on this button, it's going to take me to localhost 3000, that's where my app is running on my machine, slash auth slash Twitter slash callback with a bunch of data after it. Right? And remember I said that the, the regular authentication flow is before we start talking to Twitter, we tell it, in the event of when authentication completes, here's the URL that you should call back so that I can handle, I, Rotten Potatoes, can handle uh, either a successful or an unsuccessful authentication. So that's what that is. Uh, I will now click on the button to take me there, and boom, I get an unauthorized error. Not very graceful, but this is only because I didn't do anything special in the failure handler. We're going to show that in a moment. But for this example, uh, what I would do in a, a normal production app is I would provide in my controller method, I would look at the response and say, oh, something bad happened. I would display a friendly message, and life would go on as it always has. All right, so where are we? So Let's look at the sessions controller that actually, oops. So what are the, uh, the, probably the most interesting method is the create method, because this is the one where you have to handle the case that the user decided to actually authenticate um, and go ahead. So how are we handling it in this case? Um, remember these dynamic finders where you can find by whatever you want? Um, I'm, I wrote this code under the assumption that I might change my mind about which authentication provider to use, or that I might give the user a choice of you could sign in with your Twitter or your GitHub or your whatever account. So actually, I, I want to be able to keep track 
of both the provider name and the user ID that that provider thinks the user is. Right? So I have some unique user ID on each one of these services. It's probably different on every service. But we need a way to map the services idea of who I am to Rotten Potatoes idea of who I am. So basically, I did this by adding a provider and UID column to the uh, users table, to the moviegoers table, I should say. Um, and when I get the post back from Twitter, my create method gets called. Uh, if you look at the OmniAuth documentation, it will show you that you can get this hash, which is basically all the parameters that got sent back by the auth provider. So Twitter's API says, here's the fields that come back on successful authentication. All of those fields become available in this omniauth.auth hash. Um, and I am using the provider and UID fields, which again, how do you know this? You read the Twitter documentation. Um, I'm going to use the provider and UID fields. UID is what came from Twitter. Provider is what I told OmniAuth I was using. So um, if I already have a user, in other words, if I recognize who this is, right? somebody has previously logged in and established that with respect to this provider, they have this unique ID, well, then I'm done. Because that's the person who just authenticated. right? Twitter just told me this UID. And if I've already seen this UID in the past and associated it with somebody, then all I got to do is make this person be the active logged in user. If not, what it might mean is that this user has never logged in before. I have no record of this person existing. So I will create them. And we're gonna, in a minute, we're going to look at this create with OmniAuth method. Um, but let's leave that aside for the moment. The, the only thing I really end up doing is I record the ID of the active user in the session. The session is tamper evident. So uh, in the future, basically, I can declare a before filter, just like I showed earlier, that checks session user ID. If it's non-nil and it corresponds to the ID of an existing person, that person is logged in. Otherwise, nobody is logged in. Um, and then I do a redirect, and the person is in the app. So that's how you set up a session. What if failure happens? Well, as you saw, uh, I didn't do anything in my failure method. I just raised an exception, and um, I wanted to show what the parameters of the failure were. But in real life, you would put up a nice message saying, please try again, or, or whatever. Um, and session destroy is what would get called if somebody actually logged out of Rotten Potatoes. And then all I do is delete the user ID from the session, so it shows that nobody is logged in. Um, so what about this create with OmniAuth? What's going on there? Let's go look at the model. So what does uh, create with OmniAuth do? Well, the, the premise here is I've never seen this user, right? Because if I had seen them before, I would have recorded their Twitter-provided UID as part of the, the uh, uh, I would record their Twitter-provided UID as the UID attribute of that person in the moviegoers table. So if I've never seen them before, what do I do? Well, I create them, right? And what fields do I fill in? The provider that authenticated them to me. The provider's, ID, the provider's idea of what the unique ID of that person is. Um, and in this case, I can also populate the name field, because the Twitter developer API tells you that in the list of parameters you get back, you'll get an info hash that has a name property. It also has a few other properties. Um, and then depending on what privileges you ask for from Twitter, you can do additional calls to get things like who you're following and stuff like that. But in this case, all I did was use some of the information that comes back just as part of the authentication response. So in this simple example, um, I now have the token, and I could do additional calls to Twitter to find out other stuff. In fact, there's various gems that allow your Rails apps to talk to Twitter, but you're sort of uh, keys to the kingdom where you have to get authenticated first. So that's what this example focused on. So you know, kind of to sum up, what do we do here? We have we used a gem that abstracts and provides a uniform API to any third-party auth provider. Um, we had to set up routes that will handle callbacks from the auth provider, both in the case of success, in which case we want to create a session and establish that this person is the logged in user. Uh, in the case of failure, I didn't do anything fancy, but you would want a method that puts up some sort of a friendly message um, and to handle logging out. So if the user logs out of Rotten Potatoes, um, then you want to forget that they're logged in. That's sort of independent of how they authenticated themselves to begin with. Um, this is all predicated on the fact that I've already registered as a developer my app with Twitter, because in order to even engage in this conversation, I need to have these tokens that are assigned on a per app, per developer basis. So if your project team wants to do this, you would go to Twitter or however many authentication providers you want to interoperate with, and you would generate a key. Uh, and by the way, the reason it's called consumer key and consumer secret is that's OAuth terminology. Uh, OAuth is the standard that's used by most of these sites to do this protocol. And in OAuth, consumer secret and consumer key is what they're called. So that's what uh, the OAuth gem calls them too. So you'll get your consumer secret and consumer key for uh, as many different sites as you want. You'll provide that info in auth.yaml. 
um, you'll provide a list of preferred authentication providers, and you can just have links in your app to say authenticate with. And pretty much OmniAuth will take care of routing to the correct page, dealing with the callbacks, and all you're doing is providing these three endpoints. It's very nicely abstracted. Another reason to use OmniAuth, by the way, is even if you want to have your own login where you collect the password, you remember the user's password, there's a lot of ways to do that badly and insecurely. OmniAuth has a strategy for local authentication that's actually decent. Um, and it has a strategy for local authentication that doesn't require any password, and you can use it for testing. So a standard problem you have when you're doing password-based anything is to demonstrate things to people, you have to create a bunch of fake logins for them. And with the OmniAuth testing strategy, you don't have to do that. And OmniAuth also comes with test hooks to make it easy to write Cucumber scenarios like how I log in and you know, if I'm a logged in user or given that I've been logged in successfully. Uh, it provides essentially macros and stubs so that you can do a lot of that stuff without having your app actually call out to the providers that you're trying to authenticate with. So in case you haven't gotten the message here is use OmniAuth. Don't do your own login information because nobody wants to remember yet another password. Every, let's just face the fact. Everybody's on Facebook anyway. Just use that. All right, so that will conclude our uh, first part of today's lecture. Um, so yeah, last video was about how many hours, and I happen to be working on a product that uh, that actually implements a um, OAuth provider. So all the professor has been talking about is um, the client side or the consumer side of um, the OAuth protocol. Um, there's actually a lot more happening if you are to implement a uh, provider side of uh, Omnion, sorry, OAuth. Uh, if you are interested, feel free to ask me. I have actually went through quite a bit of uh, documentations and documents and reading materials uh, that's uh, kind of explaining how OAuth works. Uh, and as, it's actually pretty interesting, <laughs> but uh, again, this is completely optional. If you are interested, feel free to reach out to me and I can provide you with some materials. Um, but otherwise, we're done with the video today. Um, so the second part is supposed to be a practice session. Uh, but since I have a deadline to, <laughs> to meet, um, and if you are going to be a engineer or software developer, uh, be prepared for that. Um, that's very common in the IT world where you will have uh, deadlines and you need to come. And when you get close to the deadline, um, that's usually what happens. Like things become super, super busy, really crazy, and then a lot of stuff to, to do and fix and update. Um, but anyway, yeah, that will conclude our lecture. Um, today, uh, I'll, I'll skip the Google Meet part, uh, but if you got time, um, please, please still uh, do the practice yourself. And I will still be available for questions. So if you run into any questions while doing practice, uh, feel free to give me a message in the chat and I will be there to help. Um, all right, so, and then remember uh, the homework for week three or this week is either do the summary uh, for chapter three or do the hands-on practices uh, that we've already talked about uh, in last video. All right, so uh, we'll end here. See you next week. Bye.